Um, yeah, uh, I thank the organizers for inviting me. And it's uh, really always a pleasure to be at a summer school, particularly on quantum chaos. And uh, very unfortunately, I cannot be in Sao Paulo in person uh, for some uh, stupid health reason. I'm very sorry about that because I was really looking forward to the summer school. And also, second reason is I've never been to Brazil. So my first visit to Brazil is now via the Internet, and it would be much nicer to be there in person. Okay, Baba gave already quite a few uh, pieces on information on quantum chaos as a whole. I will concentrate very much on the random matrix aspects, but of course there will be overlaps between things that uh, Barbara already said and that I will say, but I think that's good because it always helps to see the same thing from two sides and um, particularly in such a school, there should be some uh, repetition aspect also. Yeah, so that is the outline of my talk. It is really a tour the horizon. So I try to present different aspects. So it's like a visit to the zoo. So we look into some of these cages with animals doing this or doing that. And after this talk, I hope that we have some kind of a picture of what random matrices are. So more formal aspects and more mathematical aspects will be in my next talk. And then in the other lectures, I have some more specialized aspects. So this talk will be about, first of all, what are random matrices? Why are they important in physics? I will present quite a few examples. And I will reiterate a few things about the connection to quantum chaos. But most of it, of course, I will leave to uh, Martin, who will then speak about the semi-classical connection. And he knows a lot, a lot, a lot more about this than I do. I'm really the random matrix expert. I will speak a bit about single versus many body dynamics because that is a, a, a very, very um, 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 interesting topic um, which developed in the last years. Even so, it had always been around, but people didn't pay so much attention to it. Only more recently, they realized how important it is. Then I will speak about spectral transition in random matrix theory. And you will see that it's particularly important. So when we go from one symmetry to another symmetry or from regularity to chaos or things like that. Main reason being that if we have such traditions, we can use random matrix theory as a tool, as a method, as means of analysis to extract other information about the system. And that I will present by discussing breaking of time reversal, uh, breaking of symmetries and breaking of regularity. So I start from scratch and it will be very phenomenological what I'm going to tell you now. And I will start with uh, one of the most historical examples for that. You might remember that Barbara already pointed out that random matrix theory was actually developed in nuclear physics. But this is true for the random matrix theory as put forward by Wigner. That was in the early 50s. Actually, there is already another, there was already another random matrix theory in a completely different context, in the context of statistical inference that was developed in the late 20s, early 30s by Wishart. So there are two random matrices. And time permitting, I will, in one of my later lectures, speak about this Wishart random matrix theory also. So here we are in the Wigner world of random matrices. So let's look at a typical nuclear physics experiment where we would uh, benefit from doing a random matrix analysis. So here you see a picture of a heavy nucleus. So in this cartoon picture, the protons are blue, the neutrons are uh, orange or red. And now we do the following. Now we bombard this nucleus with slow neutrons. So the emphasis is on slow neutrons because we do not want that the incoming neutron just shatters this nucleus. So it is slow, 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 slowly coming in. And then this nucleus absorbs it, which means it gets energy. It absorbs the nucleon, uh, the, the incoming neutron with its energy. So it is in excited state of the nucleus composed of the same number of protons, but number of neutrons plus one. And that is called the compound nucleus. And actually this is on nuclear scale, it's a relatively stable system which means long times so or relatively stable. Um, if it decays, which it eventually does, the corresponding energy scales are very short. So that you see here in a measurement. So that is an energy spectrum of such a compound nucleus. In that case, thorium-232 bombarded with low neutrons. You see here very sharp resonances, so very narrow resonances because it, 
the lifetime of these states or this compound nucleus are relatively large. Uh -huh. Now we want to understand such a spectrum and then we have face, of course, a very big problem. So we have 232 particles here, say. So A is in nuclear physics always the number of particles. That is number of protons Z plus number of N neutrons. So we have to solve a Schrodinger equation for three times A particles, and A is something like 232. So that is just humongous. And here I present the Hamilton operator in actually very simplified form. So I ignore degrees of freedom like spin and all that. So I just uh, pretend that this is uh, uh, so we, we can simplify it in this way. So here I have the kinetic energy operator of all the protons here, of all the neutrons. And here I have now the potential. So that is between the protons, because the protons are also subject to the Coulomb energy. Yeah? Here between the neutrons, they are not. They only feel the strong force. And here I have between uh, 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 um, protons and neutrons. And this is a bit different because uh, also some other parameters are different. Well, this is a humongous problem. and. Um, in some cases, you can actually solve those problems. In some cases, you can calculate individual resonances of this type, because sometimes you really need information on individual resonances. But still, it is very, very, very difficult to do that. But most importantly, we are not really interested in individual features of these resonances. Most importantly, we are most often we are uh, we are not, not interested in that. In that case, we are only interested in statistical features. And that was the uh, this idea was actually the birth of random matrix theory. So let's look at a very basic statistical observable which Barbara already introduced. We want to measure the distances between adjacent levels. So the emphasis on adjacent. So really the distance from here to here, from here to here, distance from here to here, distance from here to here. So not the distance from, say, here to here, because there is a level in between. So adjacent neighboring levels, that's what we do. And now we measure them on the scale of the local mean level spacing. And what we get is this histogram here. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. And we will see, and we heard already a lot about this already in Barbara's talk, is that this is chaos. Oh, this has to do with random matrix theory. And this is seen very, very often in many, many systems. I show you more examples. What is characteristic about chaos? Characteristic about chaos is the suppression of degeneracies. So you see the probability or probability density of finding degeneracies goes to zero. And so the levels repel each other. You know, they don't like each other very much. They try to be a bit apart. Huh? This is very, very different from the so-called regular case. So that is a Poissonian case about which Barbara spoke. So take on your personal computer, take a sequence of uncorrelated random numbers and say, oh, this is my spectrum now. So the numbers are the energy positions in my spectrum. And then work out the distribution between the, uh, uh, between the space uh, of the spacings between adjacent numbers. And that you will, that you will find this exponential function. This is a Poisson distribution that Barbara already showed you. So you see that it's completely different. So here's a probability or probability density of fine degener degeneracies is very large or as op uh, opposed to the chaotic case. Now, another observable already introduced by Barbara is the level number variance. So if we agree to normalize everything to the scale of the local mean level spacing, we have by construction in an interval of lengths L, L levels on average, uh, by construction. And the level number variance is just how much does it fluctuate? So you know that actually from experimental physics. So if you, all of you probably did in some experimental class, uh, some experiment on Geiger counters uh, or some, some nuclear counter events or things like that. And then you have the number of counts and try now to estimate the error. And what do you take as an estimation of the error is the square root of the number of counts. And this is exactly what you would expect in the Poissonian case. Uh, and it is really true. In the Poissonian case, so for the spectrum of uncorrelated random number that you created by your in your personal computer, it is really so that we have L plus minus square root of L levels in interval of length L. So the error is really square root of L. 
which means that in this regular case, sigma squared of L, the variance is linear in L. And now how different that is in the chaotic case. Huh? In the chaotic case, the sigma two of L behaves logarithmically for large L. And this is so because these levels don't like each other. They push each other away. They do not want to degenerate, which means essentially that this spectrum is more rigid. You know, there are less, so the levels cannot explore <laughs> the energy scale as well as in the regular case. So they are forced, forced to uh, um, um, a smaller, uh, uh, to, to uh, this rigidity that, that sort of forces the levels to stay more or less where they are. Now, here you see this uh, um, nearest level spacing distribution. That's an observable on the scale of one mean level spacing or two mean level spacing, so short scales. But this level number variance, it goes in principle to all scales. Huh? So it goes to uh, uh, four, five, six, seven, ten. Um, mean level spacing. So that is a long range observable. Now, short relation to chaos. So let me briefly summarize what Barbara said here. Let's do the following. We take this billiard, which is a Sinai billiard. So it's a square. And now we take out the circle here in the middle. And now we play classical billiard. And you have already seen a picture like that in Barbara's talk. I have here two trajectories, a red one and a green one which differ only by a tiny, tiny little angle here near the initial point. But you see, after some reflections, whoa, they start deviating very, very much. Huh? So after a while, so the green and the red trajectory have nothing in common anymore. So actually, these orbits separate at an exponential rate. And that is typical for classical chaos. So that is the characteristic feature of classical chaos. And now we solve the Schrodinger equation in this geometry. So the condition is that the wave function is zero at the boundary here and at the boundary given by the circle here. And we get once more this histogram, which is almost indistinguishable from that histogram and actually described by the same function, which I will present you later on. It is labeled here GOE. That is what you already heard in Barbara's talk. That is a Gaussian or Sorgner or something. And once more, the comparison to the Poissonian case, so completely different. But there's an important point here, very important. So that is for a system where you have one particle in a complicated potential. But here we had many, many, many particles. Also with complicated interaction, but it was a many-body system. Big difference. I come back to that many times during my talk. Now I want to say something which might surprise you a bit. What I have been speaking about so far is from the statistical point of view, not really specific for quantum mechanics. It is only uh, specific for waves. And uh, therefore people nowadays, they speak more generally of wave chaos and not so much of quantum chaos anymore when they speak about the statistical features. No? Quantum chaos is really restrictive to this classical quantum connection, but some more general statistical aspect people now speak of wave chaos. Okay, I want to give you here <laughs> one of those examples, which is quite striking in that. So here you see a quartz crystal. Huh? And you know, okay, if I bang on it with a little hammer, you know, it will vibrate. So there will be mechanical elastodynamical vibrations. And so it's like a church bell. Huh? So if I do that, you know, I will actually get different eigenfrequencies of the system and I can treat them as a spectrum. So this is actually a measurement of something like this. You know, could you distinguish that from the spectrum of, you know, these uh, yeah, these uh, resonances in the compound nucleus? Hmm. Well, if you're an expert, yes, but if you just look at it like this, maybe not. Okay, we work out the level statistics, and once more, we get this distribution, which you have now already seen before. So many body quantum phys physics, single body quantum uh, system, and a general wave system show the same statistics. I mean, you should... Uh, uh, keep in mind here that we have here completely different interaction, completely different wave operator. The only thing what these three systems have in common is that there is a linear wave equation. There's a wave operator, which in the quantum case here is Schrodinger or the Hamilton operator. And here in these uh, classical wave cases, in that case, it's actually the Navier operator. It's not Navier-Stokes, that is the liquids uh, and fluids, and here uh, that is a Navier operator. Okay, hmm. so now we can 
ask questions. And one question was already touched by Barbara, how can we understand that for quantum systems? So can we establish a connection between the classical dynamics and the quantum dynamics? And that is very, very important. And I believe we will hear a lot more about that in Martin's talk. But here I want to ask another question. I just want to say, if that is so common and I should conti could continue now and show you many more examples, and actually in my lecture here, I will show you more examples, then the question arises, is there a simple schematic model which we can use to capture that? A model maybe in the spirit of thermodynamics. You know, thermodynamics is something fantastic. Thermodynamics applies to all kinds of systems. It applies to almost everything. I mean, you don't have to, to know anything. You often do not even know um, what kind of particles the system consists of. Actually, if you think about it, you could build a, 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 a car engine, so uh, an, um, an, 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 an engine uh, of the usual type or a, a, a turbine or something, without even knowing that matter consists of individual particles or that uh, matter has a discrete nature. Because the laws of phenomenological thermodynamics are so general, so fundamental, that they apply to everything. So here in our little, much smaller spectral world, where we have spectral, spectra and want to look at spectral statistics, we try the same now. We try to set up a model with as little input as possible. And that's the basic idea of random matrix theory. So in the case of regularity, uh, we already have our model. We say, okay, I have a sequence of uncorrelated random numbers. Yeah? And so I call them energies, yeah? and this is my model for my Hamiltonian. Good. And then you will see this Poisson statistics. Hmm. The main difference we have seen between the Poisson statistics for regularity and the chaos was that we have here a high probability for degeneracies and here a very, very low probability for degeneracies. And I want to argue now that this is due to the correlations or interactions within the Hamiltonian. So we want to set up a model for chaos now. So we take a matrix, a finite dimensional matrix, and we take all these entries here in this matrix from Gaussian as Gaussian distributed random numbers. If we want to make connection to a physics system, so let's say, okay, let's put it, choose in such a way that the matrix is real symmetric. Important is that we have these off-diagonal matrix elements. That is really important. These off-diagonal matrix elements will make sure that we have this level repulsion so that we have no degeneracies of eigenvalues. Okay, well, this is a matrix model. So how to make the connection now to quantum mechanics or to uh, elastodynamics or so? Well, we have a Hamilton operator uh, or a wave operator more generally, and now we choose a basis of our Hilbert space. We choose your, your favorite basis. Huh? And um, the point is usually that uh, most of these bases that we need in that context would be an infinite basis. Huh? Mm, but to work with infinite dimensional matrices is, oh, okay, we need a cutoff. So let's say we make the matrix very large. So N, the dimension of this matrix is a very large number. Of, but of course, at the end of the day, we have to make sure that this cutoff does not change the statistical feature. So we have to guarantee in one way or the other that the limit N to infinity does not change the results. Oh, so that we are sort of in a region where N is already large enough. Okay, that is what we want to do. Good. And I said we check Gaussian random numbers. I will speak about this later, so what happens if we change that. But let's do that for the time being, and then this already defines the Gaussian ensembles, as you heard in Barbara's talk. But this is not the end of the story, these Gaussian ensembles. Now I want to come again to this case of nuclei. So now you might think, after what I told, that Nuclei always have chaotic or level statistics, so level statistics described by such random matrices here. But the answer is no. And this is so because nuclei are many body systems. So in this compound nucleus example, where we had this nucleus consisting of many protons and neutrons, and there was a slow, slow neutron coming in, and the nucleus absorbs it, and there's some energy which is sort of brings this combined nucleus, the compound nucleus, to some excited state. 
That is one way of exciting the system, but there are other ways. Let's go to very low energies, very, very low energies. It so happens that the nuclear interaction is so complicated that near the ground state, many nuclei are not spherical. They're actually ellipsoids. It is so. So the nuclear interaction favors ellipsoidal shapes for many nuclei near the ground state. And then it is possible to excite such a system in such a way that all protons here drawn as these green dots pretend to be in one ellipsoid and all neutrons pretend to be another ellipsoid, and these two ellipsoids move against each other like a pair of scissors. The point is now that the particles within these ellipses have no relative motion. So the neutrons are like frozen huh, in this ellipton, and so are the protons. So it's a completely different type of excitation. And if you now think about it, the number of degrees of freedoms of this type of excitation is very low. There's actually only the angle here in this uh, motion, like a pair of scissors. Right? And this drastic reduction of the available and used phase space, that actually favors regular motion. Regular motion is always where we have enough integrals of motion so that we have some kind of boring, simple solutions. And that would be what happens here because we drastically reduce the number of degrees of freedom in this phase space. And let's look at the level statistics. Yes, indeed, indeed. These experiments are actually very complicated. Yes, indeed, the level statistic is much closer to Poisson than to the chaotic Gaussian ensemble case. It's not perfect, but as I said, these are very difficult experiments. But in any case, you see the probability density of finding degeneracies is definitely not zero here. Aha, so we see what makes many body systems so difficult and interesting is that depending on the means of excitation, they can show completely different level statistics. Okay, we keep that in mind. Yeah, after all, what we will always talk about in random matrix theory are the correlations. So I spoke about correlations within the Hamiltonian, but here I mean now the correlations of in the spectrum. So I show you a famous picture that was first presented by Bohigas in a, in a very influential review in 1984. So here I show you spectra and other sequences of numbers. And these sequences are normalized in such a way that first of all, they have mean level spacing one, all of them. And secondly, which of course is connected to that, that all of them have the same number of levels. Uh, so, so the number of levels in all these six sequences is the same. And these are now a sample. First of all, Poisson. That was your experiment on your personal computer. You see, whoa, we have many degeneracies, and therefore you also have many gaps in the spectrum. These are prime numbers here. You see, oh, there are also big gaps here of <clears throat> degeneracy. So these little arrows, they always indicate the degeneracies. And then we have um, such a compound nucleus reaction, so neutrons, low neutron on aerobium, 166. And you see less degeneracies. So you see Nye billiards, this is a compare that looks very similar, actually. So that is what I showed you, this billiard, and what Baba showed you. These are the zeros of the Riemann zeta function. And that is uniform, because so that's a one dimensional harmonic oscillator. So you see here, that looks really different on the scale of the local mean seven spacing. So these are the correlations. So these differences that you see here, that you visually get here when you look at this picture, that is what we are talking about. That is what interests us in random matrix theory. And please notice that the two extreme cases, so the Poisson here and the uniform, these are both integrable cases. These are both regular cases. Yeah, the one dimensional, Harmonic oscillator is integral, that you know from your quantum mechanics lecture. And this is also regular, as you already heard in Barbara's talk. Now, I said it is very important that we normalize to the local mean level spacing. And uh, here I sort of reiterate what Barbara already said. So if I write N of E, the number of energies smaller <clears throat> at energies E or smaller. Huh? So then this n of e is a staircase function. So it's a function like this here. That is n of e. Oh, so it's a staircase function. And um, well, you know that in any decent physics system, it grows. 
Ja, so the, the larger the energies, the denser are the um, uh, eigen energies. Ja, so we have the level density grows with energy. So which means the N of E becomes steeper, 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 steeper. Ja? So the idea is now that we map that onto a scale in which that does not happen, in which we are like a little dwarf walking along here this uh, smooth fit, which I call an average of E. And this little dwarf looks to the left and to the right, and then he assesses the fluctuations of the spectrum with respect to the smooth part. Uh, this is what we want to do. And so we decompose the N of E into an average part and a fluctuating part. And the average part is by its very construction. If I take the derivative with respect to E, I get the level density. So in my notation, level density is R1 of E. Barbara called it rho on some of her transparencies. Hmm. How can I sort of mathematically do what the dwarf does? Well, if I define a new energy, I call it psi, in such a way that I take the old energies En, it's a function and average. Huh? Then I have exactly that, because if I calculate the differential now, d psi n, this is an average prime of en, d en. Uh -huh. And then you see this is rho r1 of e d e. Huh? And on the left side, there is one. Uh -huh. I have shown that the level density on this energy scale c is one. Huh? And therefore, also, the mean level spacing is one. Why do I want to do that? The main motivation is we have seen that uh, phenomenologically now that random matrix theory probably applies to very many completely different systems. Atoms, I haven't shown you an example yet. Nuclei, there's nuclear interaction, then we have this elastodynamics, and we have the billiards. So the interaction and all that is completely different, and also system uh, system specific features of other kinds are completely different. And our way of comparing these very different systems is by normalizing to the same level density, to the same local mean level spacing. Okay. Now this level number variance, which Barbara showed you, and which I showed you, I want to give you now a definition of it which is a very practical experimental one. So Barbara gave you the more mathematical definition as it pops up from uh, 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 the statistical theory, but I give you now a very basic uh, empirical or experimental definition. So we divide our um, unfolded energy scale, Xi, into capital M windows. I just realized that this is uh, from a German talk. So Fenster means window. So this is window number one, this is window number two, this is window number three, and so on. So if you have the unfolded spectrum divided in M windows, we have M plus one, such numbers eta, eta zero, eta one, eta two, eta three, and so on, which define the left and the right side of the window. Now I define empirically, uh, new M of L, that is the number of levels in the window M, if I decide that all windows have the same length L. So the difference eta m minus eta m minus one is always L. So they all have the same length, they're all L. And then by definition, new m of L is the number of levels in window m. Aha. And now I can do averages. I average over all uh, windows, and then I get the average number. And I can also average the squares, and then I get the average of the squares. And then it's very obvious what the level number variance is. It's the difference of n squared averaged minus n average squared. By construction, by construction, let me reiterate that this average must be L due to the unfolding. So I could as well write here average n squared of L minus L squared. So that is a definition where you, for which you need no theory no random matrices, nothing that is just a plain definition for an experimentalist who doesn't care about any theoretical theory. Now, the spectral rigidity, as Barbara already said, is a very closely related quantity. Due to our unfolding, uh, we know that in such a window, we have these M windows, uh, so the um, staircase function should fluctuate around a straight line. Uh, 
So here I define things in such a way that in each window I put the side to zero. So that is for a given window new for a given window m and and m of xi now is the number of levels yeah, as a function of xi and xi is between zero and l. So the spectral rigidity is nothing else but the fit, the fit of this staircase function to the straight line a xi plus b. So here you see that is a least square fit, you know, new, new m of xi minus a times xi minus b squared integrated from zero to L, and now I have to minimize it. And this is, for those of you who are interested in experimental physics, this is nothing else but the definition of the chi-squared. But it's a chi-squared as a function of L, so as a function of the length of the interval under consideration. This is a specular rigidity. And of course, then I have to average over all these windows to get the specular rigidity for this particular system. Okay, now, we know a lot. We have already seen a lot of phenomenology. We have seen a lot of observables and things and pictures. So now we want to be a bit more mathematical and set up the model in a slightly more formal way. Actually, in my upcoming lecture, I will say a bit more about that. But here, yeah, I want to, want to make already a few points. And I, I realize that this fits very well to what we have already heard from Barbara. In a very old paper, Wigner and von Neumann, almost 100 years ago, looked at all possible Hamilton operators and they realized that the decisive criterion to classify these Hamilton operators is first of all, the question whether or not they are time reversal invariant. So time reversal invariance is something really amazing. As Barbara already said, is an anti-unitary operator, so there is no quantum number assigned to it. It is not a symmetry in a strict sense. It is an invariance. Now, if I have no invariance under time reversal, then I must, according to the foundation, founding principles of quantum mechanics, I have to have a Hermitian Hamilton operator and therefore also Hermitian random matrices or matrices uh, in general. If I have invariant under time reversal, it turns out there are two possibilities and they are distinguished by the spin of the system. If I have integer spin or half odd spin with rotation asymmetry, then I can choose H as real symmetric. So that is exactly the nuclear case. So that happens in the nuclear case. But then there is another case, which is a bit special. If I have half odd spin and no total rotation symmetry, then the matrices have to be Hermitian self-dual, so there are quaternions involved. I do not want to speak much about this case, even though it's presently much in focus because there are new experiments. I just want to remind you, you probably have heard in some condensed metaphysics lecture about ions in electrical crystal fields. And then you heard that Kramer discovered that then all eigenvalues are degenerate. Oh, so all eigenvalues have a degeneracy. Oh, they all come in pairs. And now we know that this is related to very, very deep physics and mathematics. So it's precisely this case. It has to do, do with the system's behavior. First of all, that's half odd integer spin and that there is no total rotation symmetry. That's a Kramer's degeneracy. So what is this beta hanging around here? Beta one, two, two and four. Well, this is just the dimension of the underlying number space. So real symmetric, so we have only real numbers, so beta is one. Permission, so we have complex numbers, so we have real imaginary parts, so beta is two. And for the Hermitian self-dual matrices, about I will not speak so much, we have actually the quaternions. And with the unit matrix, with the two by two unit matrix, you know, these are the three Pauli matrices. So we have four, um, uh, it's a dimension four of this underlying number space, and so beta is four. Now, for those of you who are really into mathematics, I also add here the mathematics notation of these spaces. So we are uh, in mathematics, people would call these spaces symmetric spaces. And so the real symmetric matrices correspond in a mathematics notation to this quotient un divided by on, unitary group divided by orthogonal. Hermitian, they are more or less uh, um, yeah, equivalent to the unitary matrices. 
and Hermitian self-dual is unitary in two n dimension divided by the symplectic group. Okay, so just that you can make the connection if you see that somewhere, but it's enough to memorize real symmetric Hermitian and if you wish Hermitian self-dual. Now, Dyson's threefold way. Dyson's threefold way, as Baba already said, is the equip now these matrices and these spaces with a probability density and a flat integration measure. Flat integration measure high, so that this uh, means that this notation here, it means it's like a volume element. So I take in my real symmetric matrix and my Hermitian matrix, all independent variables I have, of course, to account for the symmetry. Uh -huh. So in the case of the real symmetric matrix, only the elements on the diagonal and say on the upper triangular matrix, are independent and I just write the differentials there, so flat measure. Huh? And for the probability density, I choose a Gaussian. Huh? And that's it. So that defines my Gaussian ensemble, G O E G U E G S E. And um, the case is beta equal one, two, and four. This O, U, and S, that is orthogonal unitary symplectic, so defining the invariance of this. So it is very important for my model, for my random matrix model, that's a particular choice of the basis. When I, you remember, we had our Hamilton operator and now we choose a basis in Hilbert space and make a cutoff somewhere. And of course, we don't want that the results depend on the cutoff, but we don't want that they depend on the particular basis either. So what we want is that this is invariant under any arbitrary rotation of the basis. And this is, achieved by choosing the trace here, because you know the trace of a matrix, that means this depends only on the eigenvalues. So I can rotate this matrix as much as I want, and I will not change the result. And in the orthogonal case, I can choose any orthogonal matrix here to rotate. In the unitary case, any unitary one. And in the symplectic case, any unitary symplectic one, actually. Okay, but that indicates if that is so, if I have this type of invariance, it would be smart to go to eigenvalue angle coordinates. Okay, let's do that. I diagonalize my Hamilton matrix. U is either in the orthogonal, unitary, or unitary symplectic group, and E is just the diagonal matrix of the eigenvalues. Mm -hmm. Here I'm a bit sloppy with my notation because due to Kramer's degeneracy, we have to double these eigenvalues for beta equal four. But Let's not do it. Let's just uh, be a bit uh, sloppy here because otherwise it gets just too complicated with notation. So I have to make a change of variable. So in some sense, this is like going from Cartesian coordinates in three dimension to um, uh, spherical coordinates. But here it's more complicated because we have in some sense more radial coordinates. So all eigenvalues are like the radial coordinates. So you know, um, the volume elements in three dimensions, um, so dx, dy, dz, transforms into uh, um, r squared, dr, sine theta, d theta, d phi. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we will have something similar here. And this is precisely what you see here. This is how this flat measure transforms. First of all, you see something strange here, d mu of u. So what is d mu of u? The mu of u is a so-called invariant harm measure. Ah, so I just uh, uh, told you, reminded you of what happens for the uh, volume element in for a three-dimensional vector. And so what appeared there was a solid angle, sine theta d theta d phi. So you might wonder why is a sine there? So why do I need sine theta? Why is it not just the two angles, d theta d phi? The sine theta is very important because it makes sure that we treat all points on, um, on, on the solid angle, so on this unit sphere, the surface of the unit sphere, that we treat all points in the same way. You know, so we do not give higher weight to some of the points. So we have to choose a specific parametrization with sines and cosines, and so these are the spherical coordinates. And then we have to make sure that this does not um, uh, put different weights to different points. And then if you go through the math, you see, this is a factor sine theta. And for groups, for n dimensional groups, we have something similar, but it's a lot more complicated. So this mu means that we have not only the differentials of the angles here, 
in the group parametrization, we have also sines and cosines of these angles. So it's, it's these are very messy, messy objects, yeah. But the good news is right now, for the time being, we don't need to worry about that. But this here is now the interesting part. That comes also from the Jacobian of going from the Cartesian coordinates to eigenvalues and angles. And this is a van der Monde determinant. It's the product of all energy differences, so all eigenvalue differences lifted to the power beta. Mm. If you think about this for a minute, you see, wow, whenever two eigenvalues degenerate, then this whole right-hand side is zero. So every degeneracy of the eigenvalue annihilates this probability density. Yes, that's a point. And actually, that's the only point of random matrix theory. That is how this model acts. And so this whole van der Monde determinant due to the Jacobian of this transformation is there because we have all these off-diagonal matrix elements in a fully occupied matrix. So it is as simple as that. This van der Monde determinant, that explains almost all of the phenomenology. Huh? So whenever two energies, whatever you choose, if E27 and E59 are equal, pop, the right-hand side is annihilated. Huh? So that is how random matrix, how random matrix theory works. Huh? Okay. Now we want to call, calculate the correlation functions. So the correlation functions of K levels or eigenvalues are the PDF of finding a level in each of the intervals EP to EP plus DEP, so differential intervals. So if we want to do that for K levels, we have K such intervals, and we do that regardless of labeling. So we don't care if the level is here or then this interval. So we do not want to distinguish in which interval the level just happens to sit. But then we can calculate the k-point correlation function, so this PDF of finding a level in each of these intervals, by just integrating out from this expression n minus k variables. So we integrate from k plus 1 to n, and then we are done. So this is this PDF. Huh? So it is a, um, a calculation, as you see, huh? and then because of this term here, uh, you can imagine that this is a very, very complicated type of calculation, actually. Um, in the case of beta equal 2, the unitary case, which happens to be mathematically the simplest, uh, this problem was solved, was fully solved uh, in the early 60s by Meta, Godin, and others from uh, the French school at Saclay. And Dyson solved the problem for the beta equal 1 and beta equal 4 cases then much later in the early and mid 70s. So, um, but there are closed form results. So in for beta equal to, to what I get is a determinant of dimension k by k, in which I have this kernel here, which is a sum involving the oscillator wave function. So these are the eigenfunctions of the one-dimensional harmonic oscillator. Might be a bit surprising, but it's not so surprising because you see we have here Gaussian functions. You know how important they are for the emission polynomials and so on and so on. So it's not so surprising. In the case of beta equal 1 and beta equal 4, we get more complicated structures, the so-called Pfaffian or quaternion determinants. I don't show you the result because it's really messy. Now comes the surprise. And uh, well, it is actually a real surprise because if I now look at the simplest correlation function, which is a level density, so R1 of E, and I plot it for large n, I see, oops, that is a semicircle. It is a famous Wigner semicircle. Here, the red dashed line is an analytical result, and the blue uh, a histogram that is a numerical simulation. Whoa, this is nonsense from a physics point of view. There is no physics system that has such a level density. It is completely unphysical. Huh? In almost all real systems, the level density grows with energy, actually monotonically. Yeah? There are only very few exceptions, like this notorious one-dimensional harmonic oscillator, yeah, which has constant level density. Okay, so what to do? Well, we know already the answer. 
I told you that random matrix theory or the uh, um, study of fluctuations only makes sense if we unfold, so if we normalize to the local mean level spacing. So we just bend this stupid thing, so we just bend it out by unfolding, by doing exactly the same type, exactly the same type of unfolding that we also do for our empirical data. Huh? And what I get then are new correlation functions on the unfolded scale. I call them X. Uh, so the R's go into X's because I'm now on the unfolded scale. And this, this is the unfolding. So the unfolding led that the level density is now one for all three ensembles. And then for the K-level correlation functions, we get closed form results again in the case of the unitary, so beta equal two ensemble, we get the determinant of signs of differences divided by differences. First of all, you see here that it's not singular because if I take this difference here to zero, I get one. You know, this is not singular here. I mean, due to this, this is just, just get one. And then you see that this depends only on the differences. It depends on all differences, psi p minus psi q. And this has to be so because we unfolded the spectrum, so we forced it onto mean level spacing unity. Uh, and so, therefore, it is translation invariance. It is very important. Okay, here I show you some results. So here, that is actually X2. Um, Barbara already introduced the Y as the cluster function, but 1 minus Y2 is the X2. And here you see the solid line for beta equal 1. You see the dashed line for beta equal 2 and the dotted line for beta equal 4. Aha. Uh -huh. First of all, what you see here, you see the probability or probability density of finding degeneracies goes to zero as we expected. And we see it goes stronger, the higher beta is. It actually goes with R to the power beta. Uh -huh. Well, now you might ask, well, isn't that the nearest neighbor spacing distribution? No, not quite. Because a two level correlation studies uh, the probability density of finding a level here and a level there, but there could be levels in between. And the nearest neighbor spacing distribution was adjacent levels. Yeah? So we can only take the distances between neighboring levels. And then it's clear that the nearest neighbor spacing distribution goes to zero, and this goes to some constant, so it saturates at some point. Now, from that we can calculate, and Barbara showed you the formula, the level number variance, and you see, oh, uh -huh, that is the orthogonal case, becomes logarithmic for large L, unitary and symplectic. And due to the higher level repulsion for higher beta, you see it is ever more suppressed. So the levels dislike each other ever more, the higher beta. So they repel each other, they do not want to degenerate. Huh? So that is a phenomenological uh, phenomenology that you should keep in mind. So that contains actually all the salient features of the system already on a fairly advanced mathematical level. Now comes universality. When we do statistical modeling, I'm not talking about random matrices, now I'm completely general, phenomenological thermodynamics, statistical mechanics, or stochastic process or whatever. If we do statistical modeling, all this only makes sense if it is universal. Uh, statistical models only make sense if they are applicable to very many cases. So if they have as little as input as possible, which is specific for the system, if you have only some very generic input like randomness or symmetries or so, and that's it. And then we want these models to apply to very, 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 very many dif different systems. And that's then what we need. And that if that happens, then we have universality. In random matrix theories, there are two sides of universality, and both are equally important. There is the experimental or the empirical observation that on this unfolded scale, the spectral correlations for systems with different types of interactions are very often the same and described by the Gaussian ensembles. It is a fact. It is an empirical and experimental observation. But then there is another important ingredient, and that is the mathematical fact. And that is related to our choice of the Gaussian distribution. We always said, okay, we take Gaussian distributed random numbers. Why? Actually, if you would do that, and people did that in the 60s and 70s, if you take 
uh, uh, nuclear Hamiltonian and calculate the corresponding matrix in some basis of Hilbert space, you will see this does not look like a Gaussian distributed random number random matrix. It does not look like this at all. So one could ask the question, whoops, do we make a mistake here by choosing the Gaussian distribution? And now comes the good news. And that is a proven mathematical fact. On the unfolded scale, the correlation functions are independent of the probability density. This is a very strong statement. They do not depend on the form of the distribution that I choose for my matrix element. If it's Gaussian or something else or completely different or whatever, provided this distribution does not have scales competing with the mean level spacing. But if that holds, it's completely immaterial what you take. This is a mathematical fact. So both aspects are essential for the success of random matrix theory. Now, so far I spoke about energies and uh, not about wave functions yet. But making an assumption that my Hamiltonian can be represented by a random matrix, I inevitably also make an assumption about the wave function. Why? I diagonalize the Hamilton, ma the Hamilton matrix, so I say it's supposed to be random matrix, which means that it's fully equivalent to this eigenvalue equation. Now, oh, this un is the eigenvector of the matrix H to the eigenvalue en, and the un, these are the columns of the diagonal matrix U. And these are the wave functions, of course. I mean, this eigenvector eigenvalue problem is, uh, of course, uh, the matrix version of the Schrodinger equation. OK, now you look at what you get from diagonalizing random matrices. And then it turns out that for large n, the components of these eigenvectors are Gaussian distributed with variance n. That's actually fairly easy, variance 1 over n. This is actually fairly easy to show. And uh, actually, I thought of making a problem out of it for the tutorial, but then I didn't because it requires some knowledge about hyperspherical coordinates. But if you know that, it's very easy to show. It's much easier than calculating the level correlations. So you get a Gaussian function like this. Huh? I want to prepare something which I will tell you later on, and that is the following. Um, if I make a transformation of uh, the uh, y, uh, so the y would represent an individual component of the eigenvector un here, and I transform it in this way by taking the Descartes logarithm, I deform the Gaussian distribution in this way. So I, it's a skew now, it's a skewed distribution, but it peaks at zero. And now, right now, you cannot understand why this is very helpful. But later on, when we speak about random matrices as a tool, you will see that this is extremely helpful. So I just want to tell you now here that you can do that. Even so, right now, there is no, no reason why we do that. But later on, there will be a big reason. So for which observables can we use something like that? Well, for example, electron magnetic transition. So we have an initial state in an atom, molecule, nucleus, wherever, and now we have an electromagnetic transition operator, say an electric dipole or magnetic dipole transition or whatever, and we go to a final state. In atomic physics, we have almost exclusively electric uh, uh, dipole transitions, but in nuclei, we can also have uh, magnetic dipole, electric quadrupole, magnetic quadrupole, and so on. And yeah, what would the experimentalist measure? It would uh, the experimentalist would measure the matrix element of the transition operator between these two states, initial and final, but only the absolute value squared of it. Now, if we know that the entries of the initial and final states are described by random matrix theory, so we know that they are Gaussian distributed, and then we get for this quantity just by the central limit theorem again a Gaussian distribution. Well, so that would be an immediate consequence. And uh, you will see, we will need that later on. Uh, so now comes a question, which I'm not going to answer, but we will hear a lot about this in Martin's talk. Why do random matrices work so well? First of all, in a general sense, there is no answer to this. In a general sense, one can only argue, hmm, there is complexity. And if I go to some Hilbert space basis, then the matrix looks very random and things like that. So as a general answer does not exist, unfortunately. I would love to give you this answer, but there isn't any. 
but there is a good answer if the classical counterpart of the system is fully chaotic. Let me reiterate what you already heard from Baba. There's a Bohigas Giannoni Schmidt conjecture. Random matrices describe the level statistic of quantum systems if the classical counterpart is fully chaotic. This is attributed to Bohigas Giannoni and Schmidt. Actually, it was stated even earlier by uh, Cassati, Valls, Gris, and Guarneri. Huh? And um, but uh, it, nobody really realized the importance of that, so it was rediscovered by Bohigas, Shannoni, and Schmidt. But for reasons of fairness, actually these three guys should should always mentioned here also. And then it was Barry who gave a first heuristic explanation of it, and his heuristic explanation uh, resides on the Goodsider trace formula because he derived an amazing result. The quantum spectrum here on the left hand side, so EN are the quantum eigenenergies, is in leading order H bar. So that is semi classics, leading order H bar, a smooth function, and then a sum over the classical periodic orbits as introduced by Baba of this form here. I'm cheating a bit because there is also other than this. Yeah, well, um, anyway, so there is some the classical action here. There is a phase factor. That is why I'm cheating, which I suppress here. And then there is a stability factor here. So this is in leading order H bar. So the classic periodic orbits in that sense are the skeleton of the quantum spectrum. I want to show you that in a minute. So but what happens if the classical counterpart is not fully chaotic? Then we have different levels. Statistics that relates to Berry and Tabor. It is often Poisson if we have an inequable or regular system. Okay, but let's stay with this case here, with the, with the uh, um, chaos case. So this formula here is, is very, very interesting because it allows for doing Fourier transforms. I'll show you that here in a famous example. So we take the um, uh, the quantum spectrum and Fourier transform it in a proper way, and then we see peaks. Uh, and uh, these peaks are related to the classical actions, more precisely to the lengths of these classical periodic orbits. So here we did that for Bonimovich Stadium, so that would be a periodic orbit, you know, bouncing back and forth forever. That would be a periodic orbit, you know, bouncing back and forth forever. And this would be a periodic orbit and so on. For symmetry reason, it's actually enough to only look at the quarter stadium. And you see there are very, very many of such periodic orbits. Huh? And here you see the length of these periodic orbits. Aha. Uh -huh. Well, it gets even tougher. I mean, that is an example, the hydrogen atom in a strong magnetic field. So the classical counterpart of the boring hydrogen atom, if we do not include spin in our considerations, is just the Kepler problem. So it's an electron running around a proton, or more precisely, both running around the common center of mass. Now I switch on a magnetic field, and I can switch it on very, very strongly, much stronger than the Coulomb interaction. And then I see this type of helix structure, and these are the magnetic field. Um, this is a magnetic field direction here. Now I can choose sort of an intermediate magnetic field strength, such that the Coulomb interaction and the interaction due to the magnetic field are comparable. And then I see the wildest combinations and the weirdest combinations of orbits. I see things like that. Mm -hmm. And I can look at the level statistics. And here you see something which we haven't seen so far. Here I look at the transition from an almost regular system. So without magnetic fields, this is regular. This is boring, inequal, regular. And now it makes the magnetic field stronger and stronger. And you see, I make a transition to the chaotic case described by um, the spacing distribution that we always said is GOE or uh, chaotic. We will come back to that later. But here I just want to draw your ex uh, um, uh, attention to it. Now again, we do uh, in that case uh, uh, another slightly different uh, uh, type of Fourier transform because it's of some other feature. And then we can actually analyze also the spectrum of the, the length spectrum of the periodic orbits in a similar way as in the case of the relays. Now, it is clear the longer the orbits are, the more do they explore of the available fair space. And uh, yeah, so the universal st spectral statistics will actually depend or will be sort of forced onto the system by these longer orbits. Now, so that was 
case of where we have classical chaos, but it was chaos for a few particles or actually really one particle because even the Kepler problem is essentially effectively a one particle problem because we do is reference to the center of mass. Huh? And billiards are one particle problems. Huh? So, but most real life quantum systems, for example, the nuclei consist of many particles. So the question arises, why does it make things different? I showed you already, and I will reiterate that, in the case of this nucleus, which I excite in two different ways and I get different level statistics. Another aspect is indistinguishability. In contrast to classical mechanics, identical particles cannot be distinguished in quantum mechanics. This is something we have to cope with. And now this is really very much related to what I showed you about these two nuclear examples, that is collectivity. In systems of many particles, coherent motion is possible in classical and quantum mechanics and collectivity <coughs> yields boson level statistics. This is what I told you. So all protons pretend to be in one ellipsoid with no relative motion with respect to each other, and all neutrons are in another ellipse. And these ellipsoids, like with frozen particles inside, they move against each other like a pair of scissors. Yeah? And so that is a collective motion coherent motion of all protons versus all neutrons. Mm -hmm. But this, these two points mean that the previous reasoning to explain the bohigas chernoni schmidt conjecture, as starting out from the Gutzler trace fountain and so on, does not simply carry over from single to many particle systems. So there are more things which one has to uh, take into account here. And I believe in Juan Diego Obina's talk, coming week, uh, we will hear a, lot, hear a lot more about this. But I want to give you a few appetizers already now. So let's look at a two-body system. Let us begin with two particles. So I have here a box and two particles. And now, hmm, two hard spheres in a box with hard wall and periodic boundary conditions, so I put that on torus. I could do what one does in such cases, one removes the center of mass motion. Whoa, and then one sees, what's this is just a senile billiard. This is actually how C9 constructed this. So this system is equivalent to the C9 billiard. Aha, so that two-body system is chaotic. So what should we do for n particles? Well, that would be the so-called Boltzmann gas. We have n hard spheres in a d-dimensional box with hard walls. No? So here they are. No, these are not point particles. No? This is the finite radius, the finite size of these particles. So they are bouncing against the walls, reflect, they are colliding with each other, and so on. Well, this is, of course, then, according to what we learned here, equivalent to a monumentally complicated generalization of the Sinai billiard. So where you cut out in the weirdest ways geometries from, from this box geometry. And then, <coughs> sorry, if the particle density is not too high, the dynamics is actually chaotic. And there are two ingredients you need. Here's the hyperbolicity. Hyperbolicity is that the trajectories should separate at an exponential rate, actually, uh, in a chaotic system. That is hyperbolicity. And the rate at which they do is called Lapunov exponents. So the Lapunov exponents have to be positive. And ergodic. Yeah. Actually, that was proven by Simani uh, about 10, 15 years ago, 20 years, 15 years ago. Let me remind you what ergodicity is. You know that concept from statistical mechanics in quantum case, it's almost the same concept. This notion of mixing is a bit but not, not so important here. Uh, so if I have here a cartoon of a phase space and my uh, system explores the phase space in this really, really long trajectory. I had a lot of fun drawing this trajectory, believe me. And because it's not supposed to cross itself uh, to intersect, so it had to be very, very careful. So you see, it explores the full phase space. Uh, not that it hits actually every point in phase space, but it comes very close to every point in phase space, which means I can represent time averages by ensemble averages, by just summing up points here in phase space. Uh -huh. This means that every constant of motion, in addition to the energy, restricts the motion to a subspace of 2dn minus one dimensional energy scales. So this notion of ergodicity here and chaoticity are not independent. You know? Every new constant of motion will restrict my phase space ever further. And only the part not 
sort of confined due to uh, uh, constant of motion, that is where the chaos can can happen, can take place. Hmm. Yeah, and here again, here again, I said indistinguishability and collectivity. And here, let me remind you, this was the example of a collective motion. So we here we have seen this collectivity yeah, reduces the available phase space dramatically, enormously. And in that example, it reduces it so much that there's only one degree of freedom left, the angle of um, rotation between these pairs of slippers. So, and uh, a, a nuclear system can do both. Huh? So chaos and this regularity. So the role of collective motion more generally, I want to just briefly discuss um, in the case of this classical Boltzmann gas here. Air, so this air, so which I'm breathing, which you are breathing in Brazil and I'm breathing here, uh, that is a Boltzmann gas in good approximation. So what is sound? Sound, these are pressure waves in the air, so these are strongly damped waves, but this is a collective excitation. Hmm? But very little is known about collective excitations in the quantum Boltzmann gas. They might die out as energy becomes very large. What I mean by that is the following. Um, if I look at a many body system, you know, there are all different types of kinds of motion, you know, because if, if they sort of move incoherently in a wild way, and it's completely clear just by intuition that there will be particularly at higher energy ever more different states and different forms of motion, while the number of collective excitations, collective motions cannot grow that fast. So which means if you are talking about a bound system like in thermodynamics, then you can say, oh, let's forget this collectivity because if I go very high up in energy, they are not important anymore which would probably also apply to most of condensed matter systems. But for the nuclei or atoms or molecules, this does not apply because they are self-bound. There is no container holding a nucleus together. It holds itself together. But that means there's a maximum energy. So if I do not bombard the nucleus with slow neutrons, but with very fast neutrons, it just shatters the nucleus as so the pieces fly around. And so you see there is a maximum energy which I can put into the system. And that means there is just a threshold, there is a cutoff. Huh? And so therefore it is not clear at all, actually it's really not clear, actually experimentally one knows the opposite, that the collective excitations die out, definitely not so. In any case, if you want to apply semi-classics and all this reasoning, random matrix theory to real systems, we cannot ignore, ignore uh, these self bond cases, and uh, we have to cope with that. But here comes the good news if we just look at it from a purely statistics point of view, just from a, from a practical, phenomenological, statistic point of view. Random matrix theory is an effective model only based on fundamental symmetries of the system and on the assumption of full randomness <laughs> Sorry for the Hamiltonian in a non-specific Hilbert space basis. That's random matrix theory based on fundamental symmetries of the system and randomness. So no further system-specific properties. But once we did that, uh, once we have mapped the system onto something like that, we cannot even tell if the original system was many-body system, single-body system, what kind of interaction it was. We just don't know anymore. We cannot tell from such a matrix what it was. And if we represent this matrix then by a random matrix, then it's only the question, does it work or not? And it works. It works very well for all kinds of systems, single, many body, whatever. So from a just MP, from just yeah, phenomenological, practical, empirical point of view, random matrix theory is a powerful generic model for spectral statistics in spirit similar to phenomenological thermodynamics. So now we want to speak a little bit about random matrices as a tool. So I first want to tell you a bit about the localization effect. Asking a very simple questions, actually very interesting. Um, I ask this question many people and uh, even the most intelligent and brightest people often give wrong answers. The question is so simple that you somehow really don't see the point when I first ask it, but um, this makes it interesting. I have two coupled elastodynamical systems. So I have here a church bell and I have a church bell here or something and they are coupled in this way. So I have some kind of tube coupling them and I 
um, and I uh, sold it together and then I have that. Now I take a hammer and bang on this system. And the question is very easy. If I wait some time, what is the intensity in the other system? So do I have an equilibration or equipartition of the intensities of the vibrational elastodynamical intensities after a long time? Almost all people I asked said, yes, of course, no problem. Yeah, definitely. But this is not right. The answer is not right. This experiment was actually done by Viva and Lopkis. So these are the two coupled blocks. Here you see they carved out things, cut it a bit to make it chaotic. Huh? And so the coupling you don't see. So the coupling connects here. So that's not visible here. Don't know why they drew it this way, but that couples things here in this way. And now they measure the intensity ratio, intensity E2 in the second system normalized to E1 in the first system for low frequencies and for high frequencies. And you see for high frequencies, I get an equilibration. So that saturates at one, but for low frequencies, it saturates much below one. So there is no equilibration. There's some kind of a localization. So most of the strength actually stays here. Hmm. They supported that because they were very surprised. They supported that by numerics based on real elastodynamic equations or really two dimensional elastodynamic equations. Huh? Mm -hmm. I want to show you that we can understand that with the most primitive random matrix model in no time. So I do it really in a very primitive way. I do not even have large matrices. I have random numbers, two of them, H1 simulating the first, H2 simulating the first, uh, the second subsystem, and V models the coupling. And I have here parameter alpha to tune, tune the strengths of the coupling. So I get this type of matrix here. Excitation of the subsystem means I have a source vector, which is zero in the place of the second system. So the intensity in subsystem two is nothing else but the following. I take the projector onto the subsystem two. I time evolute it. So T of T is a time evolution operator, as you know it from quantum mechanics, same in other wave systems. And then I sandwich is with the source vector, that is E2. Okay, and now I make a random number, a random matrix or random number assumption for these numbers H1, H2, and V, let's say Gaussian, and I calculate the average intensity and I get this here. I get a constant depending on the alpha, and then I get a term here, which is some kind of Gaussian average over some Bessel function terms. Aha, uh -huh. that means for large times I get here um, for this integral. Uh, um, so there are, it's, it's a simple mathematical theorem actually that tells you that this uh, integral has to vanish for t to infinity. So I get this factor here uh, for large times. And you see, this is not necessarily one. It can be anything. So it depends on the strength of the coupling. How to understand this? Well, first of all, let's compare it with the wigner lopkis numerical simulation in this two-dimensional system. You see that here. And this is our random matrix model. And you see that it describes this very, very well. Even the overshoot for short times is described by that. But this is actually more like a coincidence, I'll tell you in a minute. Hmm. Hmm. Then we did it also for random matrices. So we made out of H1 and H2, we made n by n matrices, and these are now n by n coupling matrices, and so on. And then you see, uh -huh, we get such a curve. We don't get the overshoot anymore. I'll tell you why. And that is compared to other realistic calculations by uh, Viva and Lopkis. And uh, you see, hmm, again, there is no ne not necessarily a saturation. Uh, so that, that's, uh, uh, sorry, an equilibration. There is a saturation at finite values below one. But we can explain that very easily. I want to do that now. The point is the, this, this bottleneck here, this, 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 this link, this coupling here. Imagine that I have low frequencies. Huh? If I have very low frequencies, that means I have relatively large wavelengths. So the intensity, if it wants to propagate from here to there, so all wavelengths have to get through this bottleneck and they won't. So what I have to compare is from the point of view of the spectrum, the size or the strength of the coupling to a typical mean level spacing, or in that case, a typical frequency or something, whatever. And this ratio I want to call lambda, and that is actually the decisive parameter. If I have already, or if I have, however, high frequencies, 
then the typical wavelengths are smaller and more, more waves will get through here. So where does the overshoot come from? In the beginning, so for short times, I will have some waves which just <clears throat> run through the system here like this. Huh? But as time proceeds, you know, this will not happen anymore. So the waves become more complicated. And uh, so this overshoot will go away. But already <laughs> two by two matrix, and then also from n by n matrices, we can understand that. And the important thing, was we only needed waves, randomness, and structure. So this is a structural information. So that is the alpha. We only need a number. What we did not need was a precise knowledge of the dynamics and the wave equation. I never wrote down here what the elastic wave equations are. You don't need them. And this illustrates how widely applicable that is. Next example, symmetry breaking. Let me remind you, I have some wave equation, so say the Schrodinger equation well, or some other wave equation, and I have a symmetry operator. The system possesses the symmetry if the Hamiltonian commutes with this operator. And if I go to the eigenbasis of the symmetry operator, I get these matrices. Example, hydrogen atom, boring hydrogen atom, and uh, I take angular momentum squared. So this matrix A here is now, um, uh, L times L plus 1 for L equal 1, 2, 3, and so on. And these are the unit operators of dimension 2L plus 1. Uh, so, tu, 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 tu. And these are the corresponding Hamiltonian or Hamiltonian matrices. If symmetries are absent, you don't have this commutation relation. Here, we want to uh, show you now an experiment on the crystal symmetry of quartz. <coughs> So quartz is something like this, and it's not easy to see, but I just tell you that it has the same symmetry group as ethane, so this chemical substance here. The symmetry group is D3, so it's rotations about 120 degrees, about 240 degrees, and the so-called flip symmetry. So if I grab the system along the CC axis and turn it upside down, this is also a symmetry operation. And this flip symmetry, we are now going to break. So we take such a block of quartz and use a drill, really, a really little, small physical drill to drill little holes into this to break the symmetry. So, and this is what you see for the spectral statistics. So if we do not, so as long as the symmetry is conserved, of course, the states belonging to different representations of the symmetry, uh, so it's like spins, so to spin up or spin down, they do not repel each other because it's a symmetry. So there's no interaction between them. But now we break the symmetry. So here we have um, a spacing distribution, which does not go to zero because uh, uh, the states of different uh, symmetry representation do not repel each other. So it goes to 0 0.5 or something. But now if you break the symmetry, the degeneracies are immediately lifted. Here's some compensation now. And if you make the breaking stronger, this compensation becomes more. And here we see the transition into the case of fully broken symmetry, or there's no symmetry at all anymore. And the parameter is again alpha over D. D is a mean level spacing. And what is alpha? It is compared to the wavelengths in the system, the size of the little hole that we drill. Actually, there's a funny detail. We did this experiment a long time ago in Copenhagen. And we had used commercial drills for quartz. And what always happened when we used these drills was that there were cracks in the quartz crystal. And we did not under, we were so careful, but there were always cracks. So we ruined quite a few such blocks. And then we sat in the uh, coffee room and uh, drank coffee and beer and we were a bit frustrated and uh, talked about it. And it so happened that the wife of another professor was also sitting there drinking coffee, waiting for her husband. And then she said, look, guys, I have the answer for you. So the point was, she is a dentist. Huh? And she uh, knows that, and therefore she knew that dental drills are made a bit different. So normal mechanical drills, so you have on the head of the drill, you have chunks of diamond, which have very different sizes. And the biggest chunks are... They ruin the material the most and in the most brutal way. So this is what produces the cracks. And this is do not want if somebody drills in your teeth. You don't want that. So therefore, dental drills, they sinter only um, uh, diamond pieces of about the same size onto the head of the drill. So therefore, you have no cracks there. 
And then she gave us such a drill the next day and we did the experiment and everything worked very nicely. Now, this symmetry breaking is, I want to show that here in the next example of isospin in nuclear physics, is very, very similar to what I showed you about this example of, you know, this equilibration in the two systems, in these two electrodynamical systems. The same type of Hamilton operator that we use here, and the same type of wave operator that also applied to this quartz crystal symmetry breaking. So the symmetry breaking in nuclear physics that we want to study is now the breaking of isospin. You know that protons and neutrons can be viewed as one particle with two different representations, either spin up, either spin down. So that is the protons and the neutrons. So the symmetry operator is an isospin operator, which is the sum of the isospin operators of all the particles. The strong force preserves isospin. So neutrons and protons are blind with respect to um, or the strong force is blind with respect to protons and neutrons, but the Coulomb force is not, because the protons are charged, the neutrons not. Which means in the representation of isospin, the Hamiltonian is something like that. So we have here the t equals zero states, isospin zero, and here the isospin one states. And here we have now a coupling due to the Coulomb force where the alpha, so the strength of the coupling, is experimentally the root mean square Coulomb matrix element. Hmm. And here we did an analysis. In the ca that case, that's the spectral rigidity for nuclear data. And you see, aha, that would be the case where we have no, um, uh, where we have full symmetry. Huh? So uh, we have no symmetry breaking. But here we have fully broken symmetry, and we are somewhere in between. Uh, and from that, somewhere in between, we can um, determine the Coulomb matrix element. What you see here, and you have already seen it in the case of the quartz crystal, is that there is a statistical enhancement. Because the guiding parameter is the strength of the symmetry normalized to the mean level spacing. So if I'm in a region of very small mean level spacings so of very many levels, I enhance the effect. So the effect becomes stronger. So here you see an example that again, without any knowledge of the model of the of what the Coulomb for, what, the, what the Coulomb force or the strong force explicitly are, we only need symmetry and symmetry breaking. We can analyze such a specific physics quantity, the Coulomb uh, statistical Coulomb matrix element. Yeah, and uh, we can also do that for the wave function. That was a consistency experiment. So, I mean, the symmetry breaking must also be visible in the wave functions. And I told you the wave functions are Gaussian distributed. And if I map them to this weird uh, uh, observable that I say a component of the wave function, I take the logarithm, the decadic logarithm of this wave function component squared, then I get here this deformed distribution. Uh, that would be the clean case without symmetry breaking. And so we use that because now you see if there is symmetry breaking, so the peak is shifted to the left. And from this shift, we can very precisely determine as an average Coulomb matrix element, and it is the same thing. So it's a real, it was an important consistency check. Yeah, and together with Barbara, actually, that is why I show this picture, we also did the same for coupled microwave billiards. You can also view that as a symmetry problem because it's fully symmetric, and now then you break the symmetry somehow, and we did the same wave function statistic measurement. Yeah, um, in the last minutes, I guess, yeah, a few more minutes. Um, random matrices as a tool, I want to speak about some general aspects and other applications. So more generally, what I did is I defined transition ensembles because real life electronics are very often sums of different terms in such a way that one term corresponds to a clean Gaussian ensemble, but something else is in the way. And so we have to see what how important these two this, uh, uh, these two effects are. So we have some parameter which tells us about where we are in the transition. Again, the transition parameter is this alpha normalized to the local mean level spacing. And again, we have a statistical enhancement effect if the mean level spacing gets small. Here I show you now for the unitary case a result for the transition from regularity to chaos. Uh, so we are in between a regular, a regular and chaotic situation. I show you here the two-point function 
And then you see, aha, so that is a case where we have just a clean GUE. And the Poisson case that would be here just, that would be just the one as Barbara told you. And now we switch on a tiny little bit of chaos. And you see immediately the degeneracies are lifted. There's an overshoot here. And now we propagate into the GUE case. And this has a strong impact on the spectral rigidity so the, uh, and the level number variance. So I told you that's logarithmic. But if I have this regularity chaos position, it bends upwards. So it's a very strong effect on the large. Uh, so it's a very large scales here. You see L is 100, 2, 160. 120, 160, so very often not accessible in experiments. Now, a famous result um, that is time reversal invariance breaking in nuclei, so we can also start the transition from the orthogonal to the unitary case. Um, you know, in the in the effective nuclear um, interaction, um, uh, there's not full time reversal invariance, so we have some breaking of time reversal invariance. No? And um, the analysis is so complicated that I do not present it here. I just say that uh, in the mid 80s, uh, these guys found uh, that there's 1% upper bound for the symmetry breaking. Therefore, sorry for this time reversal invariance breaking. And that was a very important result at the time. Yeah, that is now brings me to the last, very last point of few transparencies. So we can have further symmetry. So for example, in quantum chromodynamics, you know, we have gauge fields gluons and we have a gauge group and we have uh, special relativity that we have to use. So we have the Dirac equation. So everything is very different. And the Dirac equation is something which forces us to write the Dirac operator in this form that is a chiral basis. So the Dirac operator anti-commutes with gamma five. So we have some block structure that is really different from what I have shown you previously. And yet random matrix theory works. So if we make now random matrices, all of these things uh, we get for the level density, we get such results here. So I don't want to speak much about it. I just want to show that here as an appetizer that if we have chirality or other fundamental symmetries that new input, we can extend this concept very much. Yeah, and there is a long list where one can apply random matrices. I will speak about a few things in my other lectures. And uh, what have we learned? Only based on fundamental symmetries, random matrices model generic spectral features of very different dynamical systems and um, independently of the details of the interaction. And random matrices are something like thermodynamics for universal spectral properties. And this also extends to systems in which the fields, not the wave operators, are modeled by random matrices. This is a point I will not touch in my lecture. I just want to mention it here. My very last transparency is that, that here. You are here now, here, and I'm here now in Duisburg, huh? or near, near Duisburg. And um, you, what you see here is a Mercator map. A Mercator map is a cylindrical projection for nautical purposes. All lines making constant angles with meridians are represented by straight segments on a Mercator map. So that was very important for seafaring and for nautical purposes. And believe it or not, these maps were made in Duisburg by this guy, by Gerd Mercator, but a long time ago. So if you don't know where Duisburg is, at least you know now um, that a guy from Duisburg, Gerd Mercator, made these maps which had a um, large impact on seafaring. Thank you very much for your attention. There are questions. You're welcome to ask questions. Any questions now? Or ah, there's one. One moment. I will come. Professor, do you listen to me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Uh, congratulations for your presentation. I have a doubt about the zeros of zeta function and uh, it's it's the the following question for high values the zeros of zeta functions follow the G ue distribution yeah uh, why is uh, is there a link with random matrix theory uh, does that yeah, present some <laughs> a special property 
that is actually a very, very deep question. And there are many people, particularly my colleague John Keating and also Michael Barry at Bristol, um, who worked on this for many years. So it would be wonderful to establish this link beyond the phenomenological observation that it does follow the GUE. So this you do just empirically. Huh? So there was a guy named Odlitsko who just did that. Actually, as far as I know, after a discussion with Dyson, so Dyson asked him, I mean, why don't you try to? And then he did that and he found a very good agreement. Now, it would be fantastic if we knew a dynamical system, a dynamical system that corresponds to the Riemann theta function. And there is actually something which is called the Riemann Siegel formula, which looks a bit like the Goodswiller trace formula. So there are lots of indications that seem to yeah, hint at a connection between semi-classical understanding yeah. of also the Riemann theta, theta function, function and, um, yeah, yeah, I mean, to, 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 to this uh, semi-classics of quantum chaos and semi-classics of the Riemann theta, theta function. But um, maybe Martin knows more about that because he is at Bristol, but to the best of my knowledge, um, it was in the end one found very many interesting interesting features, but not uh, really the dynamical system that provides this connection. So that. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. 